<laughs> Integral and transpersonal. Hello, everybody. This is Ken Wilbur. I'm a writer, and I got my start writing primarily in transpersonal psychology. I still agree with all of the stuff I wrote at that time, but fairly soon into it, I changed the name of what I was doing from transpersonal psychology to integral psychology. I simply felt that the word transpersonal did not convey enough bases for the material I was then writing, bases that I now call waking up, growing up, opening up, cleaning up, and showing up, among others. And so I changed the name of what I was doing from transpersonal to integral. But these two approaches still have much in common, and I'd like to explain some of those similarities for today's presentation. And remember, I still agree with the material I wrote under the name transpersonal. It's an extremely important approach to psychology. Now, first and foremost, both approaches, integral and transpersonal, make room for and greatly emphasize the importance of unifying spirituality and psychology. As for the spirituality that is emphasized, I should explain that there are at least two major forms of spirituality available to human beings. One is a mythic literal version, and the other is a direct experiential form. The mythic version, which is not embraced by either school, is a result of the actual developmental stages of psychological growth that all human beings go through. Gebser named these stages the archaic stage, the magic stage, the mythic stage, the rational stage, and the integral stage. Those names mean pretty much what you think they mean. The archaic stage means just that. It's archaic, primitive. It refers to the first year of life or so, where evolutionarily old or archaic needs and drives are in play. The child can't speak or reason, but is driven by primitive emotions, anger, rage, hunger, thirst, and so on. Starting in the second year, the mind is not yet differentiated from its surroundings. It has not learned how to differentiate words and the things the words represent. This is the magic stage. It gets its name from the fact that during the first three or four years of life, for the child to operate on the word in thought is to change or operate on the real thing that that word represents. Thus, to change or alterate the word pillow is thought to change the real pillow itself. There's no differentiation between them. Hence, if the child thinks, I will eat the pillow, it will go ahead and try to really eat the pillow. No difference. Or if you put the pillow under a blanket, the pillow is itself thought to disappear magically. This is often called word magic, and it dominates the early years of life. This is also, you probably noticed, a form of the earliest religions themselves, voodoo being a prime example. In voodoo, for instance, if you make a doll that looks like a real person, and you stick a pen in the doll, which represents or symbolizes the person, then it is thought that the real person will actually become sick or hurt or ill magically. But by far the most common form of early religion comes from the next major stage in development, the mythic literal stage. This stage, which runs from about age four or five to early adolescence, although aspects of it can run into adulthood, as it does with many adult religious believers, also means what it sounds like. It's the stage of mythic thinking and mythology in general. At this stage, you yourself can no longer perform magic. You've outgrown that stage, unless there is an arrested development at it. But the mythic gods and goddesses can perform magic. And if you pray to them correctly, they will often perform their magic on your behalf. Get you that new car, or the job you want, or get you the sexual mate you lust after, or get you that raise in salary, or simply make the crops grow bountifully. One thing the gods really like 
is living sacrifice, animal life or even human life. The Aztec human heart sacrifice, for example, is well known, where the heart is cut out of a living human being and offered to the gods as a sign of devotion. And remember, there were times in our evolution where entire and very large civilizations all thought and behaved this way. But the mythic gods and goddesses dominate this stage. Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, Jehovah, Allah, Mars, Venus, as well as mythic places such as Mount Olympus, not to mention magical mythic actions like walking on water, healing the sick, turning water into wine, flying through the air, human sacrifice, and so on. Most of the Bible is indeed written in mythological terms, which includes all miracles and which remains in most forms of superstition. The Bible is the word of God, all right, the mythic God who can perform magic. In other words, about as much real reality as Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, unless you're four or five years old. That type of mythic spirituality is not the one that is a real part of transpersonal or integral psychology. If you find it at all, it is simply part of the explanation of the psychological developmental growth sequence that all human beings go through. That is, you find mention of mythic religion in the growth and developmental sequence of archaic to magic to mythic to rational to integral but they are clearly indicate, indicated by both approaches as infantile or childish early growth belief structures and not to be mistaken for the other major form of spirituality which is included in both of these psychologies, namely that of direct spiritual experience. This type of spirituality is the real and genuine form of all true mystical experiences, perhaps made best known by the Zen Satori. Satori is a Japanese term that means illumination. It is a direct illumination or immediate experience of being one with the entire universe. When you have a Satori experience, you no longer see the sun. You are the sun. You no longer feel the earth. You are the earth. You no longer watch a flight of birds. You are the birds. Your real self has become one with literally everything in the cosmos. So it is often called cosmic consciousness. And with its discovery, you feel an enormous relief and real joy, even bliss. This cosmic consciousness is your true self, your real self, and it is infinite and eternal. The major purpose in life, according to this form of spirituality, is to discover your real self and its ultimate reality. Make that fundamental discovery according to this spirituality, and you will immediately know why you were put on this earth and what your real meaning in life is. They become as obvious as your hands and your feet. Transpersonal psychology is often called fourth force psychology, in contradistinction to the other three main forces, behaviorism, psychoanalysis, and humanistic existential. But the only places in these three psychologies that recognize this real self, the only places that you will find mention of this unity, oneness, or cosmic consciousness, is in pathologies such as paranoid schizophrenia or delusional psychosis, which are in part actually defined by having this unity aspect inherent in them. That is, the only place you actually find this unity experience in one of those major, is in one of those major and severe pathologies. This is why if you ever have a major unity consciousness experience, I recommend you do not tell a psychologist or a psychiatrist about it, unless you want to be institutionalized. Or unless, of course, they are transpersonal or integral psychologists, whereupon you will be told not oh, you are really sick and need hospitalization, but instead responded to with, congratulations, you have finally found your true self. Welcome home. This is one of the major things that make 
transpersonal and integral such incredibly important psychologies. The thing that humanity at large has universally agreed is the single most important experience and the single most important truth available to a human being, namely Satori, is fully included and dealt with in a mature and adult fashion by both of these psychologies. Scholars of religion are unified in their belief that this unity consciousness experience is the most real, the most meaningful, and the most truthful experience that any human being can have. And they maintain this in a unanimous and universal fashion. See, for example, Houston Smith's wonderful book, Forgotten Truth, where the truth that has been largely forgotten in this modern world is the Satori unity experience. There is even a school of philosophy called the Philosophia Perennis, or the perennial philosophy that maintains this belief, maintains the belief that this unity consciousness Satori is found at the heart of all the world's major religions, that it consists in a direct feeling of being one with absolutely everything, or one with God, if the word God means the ground of all being, and that this experience is the most meaningful and most truthful of all experiences. To leave this Satori out of a psychology, or to pathologize it, as all of the other three major forces do, is horrifying, absolutely horrifying. If God, as the ground of all being, really were dead, then everything in the universe would lose its existence, the very reason for its being. Yet day after day, the typical psychoanalysis is on the very edge of having all of his patients who have had a full-blown Satori experience committed to a mental hospital. The person is clearly schizophrenic. This is just unbelievable to me in every way. Neither transpersonal psychology nor integral psychology would ever dream of doing such a thing. Deny and trash the ultimate reality itself? Instead, their approach is, congratulations, you have just discovered absolute reality and your real self. The way to go. For this reason alone, both transpersonal psychology and integral psychology belong in some sort of psychology hall of fame. They deserve to be in the history books. And one day soon, I believe, they will both be looked at in this fashion as being truly pioneering psychological approaches to reality, indeed an ultimate reality. Hallelujah. So I would like to end by congratulating every single one of you who is now present for this gathering. Every one of you is recognized or at least is aware of the existence of this ultimate reality and your real and true self, and thus is directly aware of the deepest truth and reality that human beings can know. I am delighted that you are all here. I am delighted that you are all aware of the existence of this ultimate truth and real self, and I am sending my best wishes and deep love to each and every one of you. Blessings to all. Goodbye and do take care. This is Ken.